Mongol, known also as Mongol, The Rise of Genghis Khan, was released in 2007 and directed by Sergei Bodrov and stars Tabanobu Asano as Temujin, Chinggis Khan, Song Hong Lai as Jamuka, and Shulun Hulun, Hulan as Borte, as well as Mo inner Mongolian actor Ba Sen as Esugai, a man who is actually a descendant of Chinggis Khan via his second son, Jagatai. Uh, this film covers the first part of Temujin's life, roughly from his father's death to just before he unites the Mongol tribes in 1206, and goes about the trials and tribulations of his career as he goes through, and shows the man who would become history's most famous conqueror before he was that conqueror. Um, and attempts to show the humanity present in his character that is often lost in most adaptations of his story. Um, speaking of adaptations, this is quite a famous one for having, for being perhaps a Biggest budgeted film about Chinggis Khan, which actually has an Asian actor in the role of Chinggis Khan. Uh, contrast that with such Hollywood classics as 1956's The Conqueror with John Wayne as Chinggis Khan and 1965's Genghis Khan with Omar Sharif as Genghis Khan. Um, Mr. Asano is Japanese, not Mongolian, but he does a good job. Um, this film was nominated for Best Foreign Film, Best Foreign Language Film, and the 80th Academy Awards, but lost to something that I did not see. Um, now, this is a historical review of its accuracy in regards to Chinggis' story. And first, I just want to say, I really do enjoy this film. Um, it's not perfect, but it has some great performances. Uh, the cinematography and the uh, soundtrack are just wonderful. Ah, great atmosphere, but we're not here to talk about that. So, first off, it is clear that they did their research and that they had access to the secret history of the Mongols, and they more or less follow, pretty roughly at times, the early career of Genghis Khan. The Secret History of the Mongols, for those of you who don't know, is a 13th century Mongolian chronicle written shortly after Genghis Khan's death, which is our primary source for much of this period in his life. Um, and in this film, there are scenes and lines and references lifted directly from the secret history, and it is much appreciated. Um, but this film covers a, about a 40-year period in Temujin's life. All right, you cannot accurately compress 40 years into a two-hour film. It's not possible. So sacrifices are made, and... There are a lot of small historical inaccuracies in this film. Parts of Mongolian culture get wrong, the chronology is off, and... But due to time constraints and the fact that an audience cannot possibly take in all of that information at once, if this is their first time seeing this subject, most of the inaccuracies are excusable. I enjoyed the film nonetheless. But... There are a couple major errors in regards to Temujin's life, which I do believe are worth to get into. Um, because there are a couple things in this film which are just entirely made up, or having them gone really leaves out a good part of his career. Um, first off, in the film, after his father Esugai's death, uh, Temujin runs off alone that first winter. Now, what would actually happen if you ran off alone into the winter of Mongolia as a small child is you would die. It's a cold and awful place to be alone as a small child. The, ra the reality was that Temujin was, a was abandoned, but was with his mother Ulun, his uh, four siblings, including an infant sister, as well as another of his father's wives and her two uh, children with Esugai. So six children, two women, all their herds and animals were taken and almost assuredly would have died. But Mother Olun, Temujin's mother, uh, bands their small group together, and they make it through, everything's great, except Temujin kills his half-brother, Bector. Now, Bector had been the eldest child, um, was competing for food, uh, possibly competing for dominance of their small band, and Temujin kills him. Uh, this is obviously, would have been quite a traumatic period, and, Temujin's young life, at nine years old, already 
killing his first person, and that person is his elder half-brother. Um, the secret history of the Mongols, depending on your translation, is either condemning him for this or is rather ambiguous on whether this was a necessary evil for him to do or an outright bad thing. And this sort of ties into another problem I have with the film. Um, obviously, you don't. most movies don't tend to show their hero character killing off one of his brothers. Uh, most of them. Um, now, this film takes a rather black and white approach to Temujin's morality. It doesn't make the audience be picky on whether they see him as a hero or a villain. Now, Chinggis Khan is quite revered among Mongols today. Um, and probably most of you are far more familiar with uh, the rather negative light he gets in history. You know, millions of deaths and, and all of that. Um, and now, an accurate representation of his character has to take in account both of these aspects. You cannot have one without the other in regards to talking about Temujin Shingas Khan. Um, and this film shies away from that aspect of his character. Whether that's necessary for a film to actually put out a statement on that is probably debatable, but nonetheless, those parts are left out. Uh, the next big error in this film is the absence of Togru, Khan of the Kirites. Um, this, he was the Anda of Temujin's father, Esigai, um, an important patron and source of support for Temujin in his young career. Um, after his wife Borte was captured by the Merkits, Togrula was the one he went to and who helped uh, reset up the alliance between Jamukha and Temujin. And they would, Temujin and Togrul would partner together over the next few years, um, well, next couple decades actually, as Togrul became more and more of a hindrance, kept losing his throne, eventually betrayed Temujin. Uh, joined up with Jamuka before he was again isolated and picked off by Temujin. Um, but his role in Temujin's early career could probably not be understated. He was, could imagine him as a shadow Temujin hid under until he was strong enough to overtake Togru and the rest of the Mongol tribes. Um, personally, I missed his absence, although the film does work without does work without having more and more names popping up, and I can understand why he'd be left out from that point of view, simplicity's sake. After Jamukha defeats Temujin, this is probably supposed to represent the Battle of Dala and Baljut in the film, uh, Jamukha has Temujin sold off to the Tangut, um, not known also as the Jijia, where he becomes a slave for, in the film, I think it's a couple, it's a year or something. Um, this is entirely false. That did not happen. Um, it is true that after Jamukha defeated Temujin in this battle, that he kind of disappears for a while. Um, and one Chinese source does say that Temujin spent some years held captive by the Chinese. Um, if he was held captive, it was by the Jin dynasty, who ruled northeastern China, centered around Beijing, rather than by the Tangut, which ruled in northwestern China. Um, so yeah, that entire sequence is just made up false, but Temujin would go on to destroy the townlet, so that part was accurate. Now, perhaps the most famous scene in the film is the climactic battle between Temujin and Jamuka. Their armies face off in front of a huge plain, a uh, massive amount of troops, and some of, or Jamuka sends out a force to attack Temujin's emplacements, and then Temujin sends out... <laughs> A dozen riders holding their swords upside down, who then ride through 300 of Jamuka's guys, cutting them up. <laughs> Everyone's having a gay old time. Uh, Temujin's forces start to get picked off, and then they retreat and get um, killed by a trap Temujin has set up. Um, this whole sequence is entirely nonsense. From the time of the battle, uh, they didn't have a fight then. Uh, the actual climactic battle, if you could call one, call in 1204 there was sort of a final battle, but they were still fighting afterwards and Jamukha wasn't even the lead commander of the anti-Temujin forces by that point. The army composition is nonsensical, far too many foot soldiers, 
holding far too many swords and spears rather than bows, and the bows and arrows and quivers they do have are rather shoddily made and don't really look Mongolian. Um, and the tactics, well, if you actually send a dozen guys riding out with swords, chopping through guys, um, they're just going to die because it turns out when you run into a crowd of people holding weapons, they're actually going to stab you with them and not just let you chop them up to bits. Um, so that's silly. Cool scene, uh, like the storm and everything at the end, and if a guy shoots an arrow and it goes like a kilometer, and it's, it's silly. If you have to skip a part of this film for historical reasons, that would probably be the part, because there's not real. There is one part that is historically accurate. The only part of the battle that I really do like is that they have a false retreat, as it's called. It was the Mongols' favorite tactic, um, and their most famous one. So Temujin sends his riders out, and they're getting picked off by Jamukha's forces, and then they retreat. Uh, Temujin sends off a signal, and it's a trap! Jamukha's forces ride directly into a hail of arrows and get slaughtered to a man, um, including Temujin's own forces, which is kind of silly. Um, that is the sort of thing the Mongols would do. Um, they would not shoot their own forces, but that was a favorite tactic of them and was used from China and the Middle East well into Europe in their campaign there in the 1240s. Um, so that's the only part of this battle which has any semblance to what actually happened in reality. And there's a lot of little things this film gets wrong, and it's not really worth getting into them. Uh, they don't show Temujin as being afraid of dogs, for example. Uh, the secret history of the Mongols tells us that he is really early on, and there's a scene where he just looks at dogs and leaves. Uh, so, and the horses don't appear Mongolian, and uh, bows are strung while not in use. Uh, Non-Mongolian characters are speaking Mandarin rather than the actual dialects, and as again, there's far too many swords, not enough bows, and just little things that I could get into for hours and hours, probably. If there's interest, I could make a video on that, but that's, that's just pedantic, because a lot of that's due to time and budget constraints. There's a lot of figures left out in this film, and again, time and budget constraints. It's already... You know, 150 minutes of film. You can't get into every single person Temujin interacted with over this 40-year period. So, but essentially, in my final opinion on this film, I do like it. Um, and I do think it is a fine introduction to the topic if you don't know much about it. You'll get an idea of some of the main figures in Temujin's life at this point. Um, I do like their portrayal of Temujin. The performances are great. I like that they showed a humanity in him. Um, he was a human being, after all. And human beings have humanity. They do good things and bad things. And they have people they love and care about and families and hopes and dreams. And, and I like that they include this and don't just show him as a mindless, bloodthirsty savage. Um, this film is not a bad place to start if you want to get an idea of the topic, but do not take it as a literal recreation of the events and the history, because it's not. It's a movie. Have fun.